So for many of us, if we find ourselves maybe in church here in person, maybe we're watching online either today on Sunday or a later date, for many of us, we've come to church or come to faith in some respect because of an experience. Maybe it's an experience that we personally have had where we had this encounter with God in some way where it kind of changed how we think and how we behave. For others of us, it might be part of our family tradition. It was an experience for a long time, and it's why we come to church, and we've kind of kept it going, and it's very meaningful to us. And it's a beautiful and wonderful thing that for a lot of us, these experiences create who we are, and they solidify what we believe. But there's a huge challenge in that. And the challenge is that experiences only last for so long. There comes a point where you will probably experience something that goes against what you've previously experienced. So let's say you had an experience as a child loving going to church. Maybe you loved Sunday school. Maybe those flannel graphs were the best thing all week. Not to mention, you know, the goldfish crackers and the super sugary juice that you would sometimes get. And you love that experience. And for you, that experience made you go, I want to keep doing this. I felt loved. I felt accepted. It was great. But there might come a point where maybe it's a little later on in life, or maybe it's still as a child, you go back to church, and it's a really negative experience. Maybe they didn't have the flannel graph or the crackers. Or maybe it's much worse. Maybe someone said something to you that you took very personally, and it was hurtful. And that experience starts to dominate your thinking. So church is no longer that great place I went as a kid. It's a hurtful place. And you probably won't want to go back. Or maybe it's something different. Maybe you've gone to church for a long time, and you're very experienced in your faith and your beliefs. Maybe you've gone to Bible studies. Maybe you've gone to small groups, and you've taught Sunday school. And you believe so many things. You've heard these stories over and over and over again, and you believe them to be true. And one day you encounter someone who believes something different than you, and they challenge what you believe. And that experience makes you go, what do I really believe? And maybe it causes you to rethink things and maybe not go back to church. If we're just relying on experience to give us meaning, to give us purpose, to give us direction in our relationship with God, it will only go so far. Eventually, there will be an experience that counterbalances or contradicts the good that we've had in the past. And so experience won't last us. For a lot of us, we're still in that experience phase in our faith. And maybe we've been there for a long time. It's a good thing. It's not horrible. It's not wrong. It's good. But it just can't sustain us forever. In the early church, this was part of what people were wrestling with. Many of them had had some kind of experience with God that was different than what they would have understood from the culture around them. And so for some of them, they have maybe even grew up a few generations in their faith and their belief in Jesus. But those experiences, while they were important, weren't what defined what they believed. In fact, the early church had to wrestle with it because there were a lot of competing experiences going on. And so they had to define what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow Jesus. And so the early church adopted their beliefs in a, like a systematic way, in like a very straightforward, logical way, and they called these things creeds. And these creeds functioned to help create a framework for what they believed and why they believed it. They functioned in such a way like a frame around a piece of art. They keep it highlighted. They bring out the goodness of the art, but they aren't the art itself. Or guardrails on a road, they keep you where you're supposed to be going. That's what the creeds are in comparison to Scripture. They help guide us in understanding what the Bible's all about. And we've had these for thousands of years and the early church used them to help figure out what they believed and also what they didn't believe, because there were a lot of people saying different things to them. And so we're in this series called, What Should We Believe? And we're looking at particularly the Apostles' Creed, which is, while it took a few hundred years to kind of solidify in what we call the Apostles' Creed, was the earliest creed that we know of. And as we looked at it, we started last week, and we... So we began with these words from the creed that say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And so the creed starts with that. And this week we're going to be looking at the next statement that says, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at the Jesus statements that come up in the Creed. It is central to what it's all about. And it should be central for us, too. Because aside from our experiences with God, we need to know what we actually believe about this God, and particularly Jesus. So this week, we're looking at this statement together, and I'm going to take a moment to pray as we try to explore more and more who Jesus is and why it was so significant for them and for us to believe this statement. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are uh, the Creator Almighty. Uh, As the Creed long ago states, as we as followers of you need to know that you are our God, Father, Creator Almighty. And I pray for us this morning that as we uh, sang these songs that reflected on your goodness and who you are, that we open our hearts and our minds to see that more and more. That Holy Spirit, we are open to you this morning, whether we're at home, whether we're, it's not this morning, maybe it's later in the week and we're watching online or listening online, or we're here in person. I pray that we open our hearts and our minds to what you have for us, because what you have is good. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this statement, Jesus, we believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. This statement in the Creed is really important to start in our understanding of who Jesus is, because it starts to paint a picture of this person, Jesus, as not just a regular person. And so the early church had to wrestle with what they believe about Jesus. And essentially they believe, which comes from Scripture, that Jesus is both human and divine. Fully human, fully divine. This was something that for a follower of God, this made no sense at all in the first centuries. In fact, it's hard for us sometimes to grasp it even today. But Jesus being fully human and divine means that he's 100% God, 100% human. And you'd be thinking, well, I know basic math. I'm not, you know, gone too far, but 100 plus 100 doesn't come to 100. That's 200. That doesn't work. And so the early church had to figure this out. And there were different movements that were going on early on before the creeds were written that caused the creeds to be written. For some people, they believed that Jesus wasn't, you know, fully God and fully human. In fact, he was fully human. And then when he was baptized, it was like he adopted his God character. It was like he put on his God jacket or something and became God at that point. And so he wasn't always God and human. He was God for a time, human for a time. And there are others who would say, well, actually, he, you know, he wasn't really human at all. He was a figure, a figment in front of people, but he was God the whole time. There were different beliefs going around in the first centuries of the church, and people were trying to say, well, this is what God is, and this is what God is, and this is what God is. And they had to go, okay, well, who is he really? There's one movement that said that, well, Jesus isn't God, but he was the first thing created by God. And in that movement, it started to gain a lot of steam. And a lot of people were like, yeah, that makes sense. That's, that's so much easier to accept than Jesus being fully human and fully God. And so the creeds were written to go, well, is that really what we believe? And they wrestled with that as a community. So it wasn't just one person going, oh, no, no, this is what we believe. you got to follow me. It was them going based on their experience. So maybe it's their family tradition. Many of them, like a few hundred years removed, had families worshiping Jesus for a long time. But also on their experience of Scripture and what Scripture says. And eventually it came to this term, which comes in a later creed, and this term that helped them understand what it means that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. And that term is hypostatic union. It's not something that comes up very often in conversation. Uh, And in fact, the word hypostatic is probably not familiar to most of us. I'd say that it's not really something that I use in conversation, even when I talk about God. It's very technical language, 
But hypostatic essentially coming from a root word that means substance or nature and a union. So it's two natures or substances coming together, not competing with each other, not sometimes one, sometimes the other, but fully all the time both. And one of the ways people tried to grow and understand this was through art. And so in the early centuries of the church, people would paint, uh, create mosaics, make paintings that would try and picture this as best they could. One of the most famous ones is from the 6th century that's found in Egypt, and it's Christ the Pantocrator, which will be on the screen. And in this one, half the, it's hard to see probably on the screen, but if you look it up sometime, it'll be uh, interesting to look at. But the image is that half is human and half is divine. And so it's almost direct, like it's pretty much directly down the middle that there's a human side and then there's a divine side to Jesus. And so the side that would be on your right by art historians would say that that is the human side. It's a fairer side of Jesus. It's, it's a kind of peaceful looking, whereas the left side is a more serious divine side. Sorry, that's my left, not yours. It gets so confusing. <laughs> so these early artists were trying to make sense of this as best they could, and it's one of the ways we can see it too. God is fully human and fully divine all at once. He's not some of this and some of that. He's fully always. And so when we come to this idea, for some of us it's hard to grasp, and I'm not trying to pretend like it's easy to grasp but it's a central belief historically of the church. And if you're wondering what makes a Christian a Christian, a Christian is someone, in part, who believes that Jesus is 100% God and 100% human. This was an early teaching of the church for a reason. Where this comes from is in various parts of Scripture. But a key one that we can look at this morning is in uh, the letter to the Philippian church from the Apostle Paul. In fact, it's a section of this letter that's one of the, I would say, earliest creeds of the church, the statements that they would say, this is what we hold to and believe, and we need to hold to it. A creed is, is like I said, it's, it's guardrails, it's a frame, it's kind of like the too long, didn't read understanding of our faith and of the Bible. It brings it all together in a succinct way. And so this early writing in Philippians chapter 2, uh, Paul says this, he says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, so let's pause there, being in very nature God. There's an argument that some people have made throughout history and still today that the early church didn't believe that Jesus was God. This is one of the earliest statements of the church. The earliest statements of the church that, yes, they did believe this. And in fact, if we go back to the series we were in just a little while ago, the I Am series, the statements that Jesus makes about himself in the Gospel of John, he's repeatedly painting a picture of himself in this way. His very nature, 100%, is God. Did, So, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature, again, that word nature, of a servant being made in human likeness. So, this very nature God makes himself in very nature human. He doesn't stop being God. He adds on human. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The Apostle Paul, as he's writing to this church in Philippi, and we get to read it today and learn from it, is giving us this understanding that the early church believed this, that Jesus is God and man. The early statement of the church is he is fully, 100%, both. It's not a little bit of this and a little bit of that, or when it's convenient, one or the other. Jesus is human and divine. 
And so the statement that gets made in the creed that we believe in Jesus Christ, his only, the, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, paints this understanding that the church should have based on Scripture that Jesus is fully human being born of the Virgin Mary and fully divine, conceived of the Holy Spirit. And on Mother's Day, it's good to note that they mention Mary because part of their understanding in the early church, early tradition, was that sin, like historical hereditary sin, was passed on through the dads. And so while this has inklings in Scripture, it's kind of something that got developed outside of Scripture and their understanding. So while Jesus is fully human, he was never attached to the idea of original sin. And while I don't know if I fully understand how that all works, but basically it's saying that, moms, you're a little bit off the hook on this sin problem, because it's just dad's fault. But there's more to it. And the more to it is that Jesus is fully human and fully God. Not a little of one and a little of another. He's fully that. This isn't easy to understand. I'm not going to pretend like it is, but it is central to what we believe. And part of it is making sense of it as best we can. And sometimes we use analogies that aren't perfect but can help a little. One I came across recently was to think about it in the context of, of these shapes that are going to be on the screen. So you have a blue square, you have a green triangle, and you have a red circle. There are things that we can say about these shapes, right? So we can say that factually, that square is blue. Factually, that triangle is green. Factually, that circle is red. 100%. These shapes are 100% one color and 100% one shape. That square is not a triangle. That triangle is not a circle. You can't have two colors in one. It creates something different. That square is absolutely blue. It is not green. In the same way, Jesus is 100% nature human, 100% nature divine. And again, every analogy has its limitations. But if we can look at the square and say, well, that square is, well, first it's a square, it's a shape, and then it's a color, it's blue. We can think of the humanness of Jesus as being fully divine. He is two natures united as one. That's the hypostatic union. So that's, again, every analogy has its limitations. So I'm sure some of you who are really smart, smarter than I am, are going, I see what's wrong with this. And others of you are like, wow, that's, that's pretty good. I like that. Ultimately, the point is not the analogy, but what Scripture points to. And that is the fullness of God is revealed in the person of Jesus. And that person is fully human and fully divine. This is central, and it matters to our beliefs. And so if our belief is based on our experience of church, our experience of God, and all those things which are good, but we get to a place where we go, well, who is Jesus? And we're not able to say, well, Jesus is fully human and fully divine, eventually our faith and our beliefs take a really hard hit. There's a reason why there's such a movement for a lot of us who are you know, a little bit younger than me, my age, even older than me, who are deconstructing what they believe. It's because a lot of the times our faith, our beliefs are based on Sunday school lessons, which are cute moral sayings and statements. And they don't really get to the depth of what's really going on, and sometimes they ignore some of what's really going on. And sometimes our faith is just about our experiences of, well, this made me feel good, so I believe it. Eventually, that experience and that cute moral story doesn't last us. And so we need to know why we believe what we believe. So we might encounter someone in our life who maybe believes something different than us. Maybe it's a Muslim friend at work who says, well, no, Jesus can't be human and divine. That doesn't work. So how do we make sense of it? Eventually, we will have these challenges in our beliefs if we are believing. So Scripture points to Jesus being fully human and fully divine, and this is why it matters. If Jesus is not human, we have no relationship to him, meaning we can't relate. 
Jesus is fully human, as in he can experience the humanness of life. He can experience hunger. He can experience thirst. He can experience the extreme hot sun on a weekend when you're working outside. There's a relatability to Jesus that we would be missing if it weren't true. In the book of Hebrews, the author says in verse, chapter 4, verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. What we struggle with, what we wrestle with and try to understand is what Jesus experienced throughout life. He was fully human. He fully experienced the challenges we face. Maybe it's not identical. There's a reality of 2,000 years of difference. You know, he's not wondering if he should be spending all his time on TikTok. But he is dealing with temptation. So we read through Matthew's gospel, other accounts where he is encountering temptation. How does he deal with it? He is fully relatable. If Jesus was not fully human, he could not die. And he died on that cross. Without that, Jesus is not Jesus. Sin needed blood to be paid. It's a horrible picture that we get through Scripture, but there needs to be some kind of sacrifice. And so if you read through the Old Testament, you see how God instructed people to give sacrifices of animals over and over again to show them their penance, their repentance, to draw closer to God and be made right with Him. As they've been disconnected through sin, He wants to bring them closer. And so there needs to be this act. If Jesus wasn't human, He couldn't have died on a cross. He couldn't have paid that penalty. But if Jesus wasn't divine, He couldn't rise again. He couldn't forgive our sins. That is something only God can do. In 1 John chapter 2, it says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Christ Jesus, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only ours, but also the sins of the whole world. If Jesus is not fully human and fully divine, his atonement is meaningless. His substitution for us, making right our wrongs, is meaningless. This is the Jesus we need, and this is the Jesus we have. One that is fully human and fully divine. If we can't believe that, which isn't always easy, we've got to wrestle with what do we believe. We have 2,000 years of history, of church teaching, of Scripture, pointing us in this direction, painting the picture of Jesus as someone who is not just human, not just divine, fully both, this hypostatic union. And his experience on the cross paints that picture, that he died and he rose again for the forgiveness of our sins and that of the world. This is the Jesus of the Bible. This is the historical Jesus of the church. This is the Jesus I worship and I call Lord. Saint, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Leo the Great said this. He said, he, speaking of Jesus, he humbled himself to share in our humanity so that we may be able to share in his divinity. He humbled himself to share in our humanity so that we may be able to share in his divinity. Because God came in the flesh, Jesus, because he experienced life like we do, we can enter into a relationship with God, divinity, and experience the fullness of life that he offers through the atoning work of Jesus. That is a gift, a good gift of grace for all of us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the God who came near to us, that you 
saw it fit to experience life like we do, to be fully human, fully God in the person of Jesus. And that we have the privilege to follow you, to confess you as Lord, meaning seeing you as our king, leader, and being forgiven of our sin and sins. I thank you, Jesus, that you uh, create a way for us to find full humanity and life in all of its fullness through the work that you did on the cross. And I pray that we come to know that experientially to be true, to know the forgiveness of our sins, to know the healing work that you do in us, that, Holy Spirit, you are with us even when we feel alone. And not just know it experientially, but to believe it and know it to be factually true. That this is the story of Scripture from long ago. That, God, you came in the flesh. You died for our sins. You rose again. And we can be made whole because of it. I pray wherever we find ourselves that we come to know this to be true. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.